Good evening dear viewers and welcome back to the review program. In this episode we will talk about the security in Central Asia, focusing on Uzbekistan, the main achievements and current issues. So what is Central Asia? Let's define the region first. Central Asia includes Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. The five nations have a total population of over 77 million people, with Uzbekistan having the highest population. Let's look closer at each of these countries. The population of Kazakhstan is estimated at over 18 million, where 46% live in the rural areas and 54% from the urban population. The population of women is slightly higher than the men. The country's ethnic groups include Kazakhs, Russians and Uzbeks. Other minority ethnic groups are Tatars, Germans and Ukrainians. The higher rate of urbanization in the country during the first 50 years of the Soviet era led to a decline in rural population from 90% in 1920s to less than 50% since 1970. Kyrgyzstan's population is estimated at around 6 million. The majority of the population, which is 34% of, is under the age of 15, while 6.2% are above the age 65. The country has a population density of 69 people per square kilometer. The majority of the population lives in rural areas, with only one-third living in urban areas. Tajikistan's population is estimated at 8.7 million, with 70% of the population under the age of 70. Tajiks are the main ethnic group in the country, although Uzbeks and Russians make up a sizable minority. The official language of Tajikistan is Tajik, although Russians is also commonly used in business and communication. Over 65% of the female population lives in rural areas. Turkmenistan has an estimated population of 5.6 million. The majority of the population is ethnic Turkmens. Turkmens accounted for 85% of the population, while Uzbeks and Russians account for 5 and 3% of the population, respectively. Turkmenistan possesses the world's sixth largest reserves of natural gas resources. Most of the country is covered by the Karakum Desert. From 1993 to 2017, citizens received government-provided electricity water and natural gas free of charge. Uzbekistan is the most populous nation in Central Asia with a population of 35 million people, nearly half of the region's population. 35% of the people living in Uzbekistan are younger than 14 years. The majority of residents are Uzbeks, while the rest of the population is made up of Russians, Tajik and Kazakhs. In 2022, main export destination included Russia, China, Turkey and Kazakhstan. Imports arrived from China, Russia, Kazakhstan. As of 2022, Uzbekistan has trade relations with over 140 countries and has signed trade agreements with 45 countries. In 2020, the country became an observer in the Eurasian Economic Union and although Uzbekistan is not a member of WTO yet, the nation is working on accession. For the past couple of years, Central Asia's role has grown in global arena. Due to the recent geopolitical events, Central Asia and Uzbekistan are becoming more noticeable both regionally and globally. Central Asia countries have engaged in various regional cooperation initiatives, including Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Euro-Asian Economic Union and Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation. According to the Euro-Asian Development Bank, Central Asia's aggregate GDP totals $347 billion. Over the last two decades, the GDP of Central Asia grew more than sevenfold. The share of Central Asia in global GDP has increased by a factor of 1.8. Its population of 77 million has increased by a factor of 1.4. The region's growing population provides huge sales market and generates an expanding pool of labor resources. According to the EDB's report, the region's countries need to overcome four key structural challenges – lack of access to the sea, resource dependence and the low level of development of the financial sector, lack of coordination in management of water and energy complex, and climate change. 
So what to expect in economic integration of Central Asian states in the near future and what are some common trends for today? For this and many other questions we'll answer our guest, Professor Michael Rossi. Hello, Professor. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming. Let's start with some basic questions. We have noticed that in recent years there are so many attention for Central Asian countries, especially in the past three and two years. What do you think? Why is it so? Well, you kind of answered it a little bit right there by saying within the last two to three years. And much of it has to do with the um, invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent uh, changing of the world dynamics with the United States and the European Union, at least officially, uh, sanctioning Russia. Uh, Russia has now uh, rather successfully looked for what I would call alternative um, economic partners. Now, Russia has never really left Central Asia. Russia has always been um, a rather close ally and partner of what we call the five stands. But alongside that, we also see the expansion of the Chinese, um, what we call economic juggernaut, effectively. And so you have two incredibly powerful countries, growing economies, especially with China, that uh, see Central Asia as the, what I call the center of a uniting Eurasian landmass. And so just by the process of being geographically at the center of this vast territory, um, countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in particular um, are now considered to be um, prime partners, key partners for both of these countries. And at the same time, both the European Union and the United States realize that they can no longer ignore Central Asia like they once did or at the absolute least, um, they don't prioritize it as much as they did Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia. So these countries are opening up. Uzbekistan is opening up, really, for the first time in more than uh, 25 to 30 years, and is gaining the attention of not just Russia, which has always been here, uh, but as I said, an expanding Chinese economy, and the United States, as I said, realizes that uh, they may have come a little late to the game, um, but they can't afford uh, anymore to, I think, ignore the region. And uh, the fact that we are having this conversation in English and the fact that um, I am teaching at uh, an American university in Tashkent, I think, is testament uh, to even the idea that the United States now prioritizes um, the importance of this region. So I know that you've been traveling to other Central Asian mm -hmm. countries too. Uh, have you noticed some change or is it like more closer to, um, like those countries are close to each other in terms of, um, what to say, in terms of way of uh, living? or economy um, or politics? Well, I've been to, as I uh, you know, like to say, I've been to four of the five stands. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one left is Turkmenistan, and uh, it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> um, I can say that um, at least as far as the major cities are concerned, and here I'm speaking about, say, Tashkent, um, Almaty, um, and to a lesser extent, but no less important, Samarkand, we can see that um, urban development modernization is not just making the countries within the region similar. They're making parts of the city look similar to other global cities. And this is especially true in major urban uh, projects that we see in Tashkent. Um, I've not been to Astana just yet, but I know that Astana is much more modern looking uh, than Almaty is. And so it's, it, you know, it's amazing that just within uh, the, the span of um, a decade, a little bit less than a decade, right? we can see um, just the, uh, the, the changes, the notable changes in the urban landscape. I've been here for the last two years, and I can say, and it's, I've, um, I haven't been, I was away back in New York this past uh, fall semester, and just coming back, I can already notice there have been some changes within Tashkent just within the last year or so. But we need to also understand that urban modernization and urban development is only good insofar as economic development. It doesn't say much about political or social or cultural. Um, that's not to say that there haven't been changes within these areas as well, but you know, simply by you know, having a Starbucks or having a, a Burger King right, doesn't make you, um, you know, any closer to you know, that of the, you know, of the West or the United States. So you've mentioned about the Starbucks and the thing that I've thought about is globalization mm -hmm. and uh, we can see that the countries 
especially those five stands are becoming more and more globalized. To what extent is it it's good and uh, where we should find the equilibrium between giving up some of our traditional stuff? So we use the term globalization, I think, rather um, loosely. And we leave it up to the audience to decide what that means. Oftentimes, we think of globalization really in two categories. The first is uh, just simply economic integration. And uh, some more critical ways is westernization, or more so Americanization. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be elements within society that feel that um, the country, the society is giving up its tradition, its heritage, or uh, to use a term that we use in class, right, an olive tree, uh, to coin uh, Tom Friedman's uh, book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, um, you know, in place of a Starbucks, a McDonald's, um, Coca-Cola. Um, you know, these fears tend to be, I think, over-exaggerated. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that as a country globalizes, yes, every country, every society um, is going to take something from the outside. It's not necessarily Americanization. One thing that we need to understand about Central Asia is that this region has been the product of some kind of globalization now for more than a century. In the idea that one of the primary languages that people speak here across the region is Russian. And you know, how many ethnic Russians live within the region um, is, you know, or, or how many people speak Russian who are Uzbek and Kazakh and Kyrgyz among others. So globalization is not necessarily a new thing and it's certainly not something that um, has only come within the last decade. Central Asia has been a center of globalization in this way since the days of the Silk Road. So in that sense, the cultures and the societies here aren't necessarily going to fear to give anything up so much as to add something right, to their collection, to add something to what makes them who they are. Yes, it's very interesting. And you've mentioned about the environment, like we are facing today, according to the World Bank data, by 2030, we are going to have a, um, like a scarcity of water resources. Um, how do you think Central Asia in the scarcity of water resources, what can we expect from other countries, let's say from Kazakhstan or Tajikistan, when there will be a scarce of water? Tajikistan, to my knowledge, um, still has um, much of the country, um, at least half the country is sparsely populated. So we're talking about mountains and rivers and um, open airs. I've been to Kyrgyzstan as well, and it's you know raw, open environment in that case. A major issue with Uzbekistan is that it is a double landlocked country yes. um, and the near disappearance of the Aral Sea has been a problem since the waning days of the Soviet Union. So a big issue is not just the, um, the presence of water or the access of water, but um, the, pre the presence of clean drinking water which within um, development, modernization, um, risks becoming commodified as well. Um, companies will um, lay claim to natural spring sources and bottle water. Um, and this is something that everybody does today anyway. But I, you know, I feel that there should be something where um, there needs to be access to clean water that is not run right, by some company. And um, knowing the population increase, knowing the um, amount of water that is used in cooking, in cleaning, um, in energy consumption as well, and also knowing that this part of the world experiences rather severe summers where it does not rain for weeks, you know, if months. Water is something that um, may very well become more of a valuable commodity, more of a valuable resource than oil in many cases. You've mentioned about the, the problems that could make uh, the countries have, well, but is it the only problem? Um, I mean, today uh, there is a lot of attention is given to the water crisis and other things, but do you think this is the only problem that we should uh, pay attention because we, as you mentioned, we are landlocked, especially Uzbekistan is double landlocked. 
Um, is there any logistical problems that we are, may face? Well, you have infrastructure. Infrastructure when it comes to railroads and roads, when it comes to power grids. You may remember a little bit more than two years ago, mm -hmm. there was a blackout um, in large parts of uh, Tashkent, most of Uzbekistan, because of something that had happened, if I'm not mistaken, in, I think it was either Kazakhstan yeah. or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if there's a problem in another country, others are affected. You know, we have to remember here that much of these countries remain on some infrastructural grid, both tangible and conceptual. So these are issues that countries that are expanding and developing and modernizing now have to take into account. So it's not just simply uh, the exterior facades of buildings or the, the spread of uh, consumerist options within the capital cities. We have to remember that there's other parts of the country that oftentimes get left behind. And many of these areas still rely on infrastructural networks that if they are um, invested in, if they are improved, it comes almost always after the first and second urban centers are attended to. And so you know, a, a big problem that we find is, I know for, you know, definitely when it comes to Uzbekistan, is that for people your age and you know, even younger, they see that the way forward, the way to um, a better life resides in, this, resides in the capital. So there is a large amount of urban migration away from the periphery into the city centers. Tashkent is growing at exponential leaps and bounds. But the city infrastructure can only handle so many as well. Mm -hmm. We see the expansion of highways, the expansion of the metro system, but this also involves new housing projects, new um, um, you know, civil engineering projects, you know, water pipes, sewage systems, t um, internet cables, um, communication, th communication networks. All of these things have to be taken into account as well. It's not that they aren't. But as, there is a, as the urban migration continues, these cities end up becoming almost half of the country's resources. And they end up taking you know, for you know, many, many of these uh, countries' resources as, you know, as, as, as needed. In what ways has Uzbekistan's engagement with international organizations, such as, as you mentioned, Shanghai Cooperation Organization or CIS, um, impacts the country? Well, it makes it abundantly clear that a country like Uzbekistan can't go alone anymore, mm -hmm. right? The days of isolation, uh, the days of, um, you know, self-reliance, um, you know, are no longer a, you know, it's just, it's just not feasible anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just simply not feasible. Um, while it's not a one-to-one -one comparison and while we shouldn't always be using this country as an example, but let's look at Turkmenistan which has decided for the most part to remain as neutral but as self-hermetically sealed as possible. They're not completely isolated from the world, but you can see, we can note the difference just in the way in which Uzbekistan now engages the world. And so in that regard, I think that President Mirziyoyev has made um, a, uh, a critically important decision in realizing that the country's future relies on international integration, cooperation, communication with as many countries as possible. There's a term that President Tokayev of, um, of Kazakhstan uses, and it's called multi-vector foreign policy. I've heard it multi-vector foreign policy, multi-vector diplomacy. But the key word here is multi-vector. This effectively implies that the country, Kazakhstan, but Uzbekistan does the same thing needs to engage with as many important international partners as possible. And this, of course, involves the big ones, Russia, China, the United States, the European Union, to name a few. But ultimately, any country that wants to work and do business, which also includes for Uzbekistan, you have Turkey, you have India, you have the Gulf states, um, you have Egypt. Um, within the European Union, I was surprised to find this not that long ago, one of Kazakhstan's biggest trading partners, if, can you, if you can believe this, is Italy. 
I didn't know that. I usually thought if, if it's Kazakhstan, it's either Russia or China. Italy is one of the biggest trading partners with Kazakhstan. That was a surprise for me. Um, and they've been having um, you know, close levels of, uh, in, you know, of, of trade and partnership cooperation now for years. And so this is um, something that I see reflected almost uh, one to one in, uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, the country came a little later than Kazakhstan because um, President Nazarbayev was, um, will, was, was open, was, was engaging with other countries. The President Tokayev has just simply taken that and um, expanded on that. President Mirzayoyev almost started from, I would say, degree zero, um, but has done much in the last seven years. And I don't see that that trend is going to change anytime soon. If, if anything, this type of multi-vector diplomacy, foreign policy, is only going to intensify. Do you want to add something? Well, what I can say is this, <clears throat> to be a, a, a sort of end on more an op of an optimistic note here, is that Central Asia is opening up. Mm -hmm. The fact that there are more tourists, the fact that a place like Uzbekistan, a few years ago, nobody knew about, Right? When I said I'm going to Uzbekistan a few years ago, the natural response from people in America was like, what, 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 Pakistan, what, 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 Afghanistan, you know, or maybe Kazakhstan, but they know Kazakhstan more so through pop culture than through the country itself. Since then, videos on YouTube showing nature, food, people, landscapes, cultural, um, historical landmarks have become increasingly popular. The one thing that a country like Uzbekistan always needs to do if it wants to maintain some kind of leverage on that global market is be cognizant of its national branding. Every country goes through what we call nation branding. What is it that people think of when they think of that country? And it usually involves art, fashion, food, um, certain elements of history. Right now, for good or for bad, for however way you want to look at it. When people think of Uzbekistan, they think of its food, which I can tell you is absolutely delicious. <laughs> but this is a way in which people can become attracted to the country more. But you also need to remember, it's your food, and you need to make certain that if it's going to go out into the world, make certain that you're the ones driving it to the rest of that world. Thank you very much. Thank you for, very much for coming and answering for all of our questions. Thank you for having me. So this was the end of our episode. Thank you for watching and don't forget to follow our next episodes.